right, in today's video, I'm going to give you guys an overview of a very cool rifle used within the U.S. military, particularly by Tier 1 groups, and more recently by the U.S. Army as a whole. So I'm going to split this video into three sections. First, I'll go over the history of the HK-417, as well as its variants used by the U.S. military. Then I'll go over the differences between a true HK-417 and the commercial MR-762 rifle, which you see here. And then I'll finish up by talking about my future plans for this rifle, and I'll actually ask you guys for some input on which direction I should go with it, because I haven't really decided yet. Starting off, the history of the HK-417. The 417 has been used by the U.S. military since roughly 2006, and has been marketed by H&K as the more powerful big brother to the HK-416, which many people are more familiar with. The main difference being that the HK-417 is chambered in 7.62x51 NATO rather than 5.56, so it's quite a, literally a scaled up 416. So variants of the original 417 include the 12-inch Assaulter model, the 16-inch Recon rifle, and the 20-inch Sniper rifle model. So the HK-417 was actually said to be present at the raid on the Osama bin Laden compound alongside the HK-416, which is a very synonymous uh, gun with that raid and with that era of the U.S. military operations in general. Like most other weapons from HK, the 417 is also used around the globe by several other different militaries and groups, particularly in Europe, Australia, uh, there are many different militaries that utilize these in various forms. The largest implementation of the HK-417 currently is the M110A1 CSAS, which stands for a Compact Semi-Automatic Sniper System. This was a contract awarded to HK back in 2016, and it was for a rifle to replace the M14 EBR. Now referred to as the SDMR, or Squad Designated Marksman Rifle, the M110A1 upgrades include a Geisley handguard, an OSS suppressor, and the SIG Tango 6 optic, along with an FDE finish on the rifle. Um, that sets these rifles apart from older HK-417 models. There are some other variants of the 417 that are worth mentioning, particularly ones used by the SEAL teams, in which the SEAL armorers have, in typical fashion, made their own modifications to the rifles to suit the needs of Navy SEALs. So I'll clip in a picture here of a roughly 14-inch variant known as the DevGru Recce, which features a shortened barrel, which is around 14 inches, a 12.9-inch handguard, and an adjustable gas block. So moving on to the differences between the HK-417 and the commercial MR-762 rifle, which you see here. So the first obvious difference is that the MR-762 is not select fire. Not that full auto is really very useful on a 308 battle rifle anyway, but... But that is worth mentioning. Like the MR-556, the MR-762 actually has some features that would prevent it from being converted to full auto such as the tab that's protruding from the barrel extension, and that will actually prevent a full-auto bolt carrier from fitting unless it is modified like the neutered semi-automatic bolt carrier that the gun comes with. And like the 416 and the MR556, the MR762 and the HK417 feature a firing pin safety, so that is consistent across all versions of this weapon system. Early MR762 rifles have a very, very heavy barrel profile, and the same can be said for the MR556 commercial rifles. But current models of both the MR556 and the MR762 have a much more lightweight barrel profile. And as someone who used to own one of the older MR762s, I can say that is a very much appreciated upgrade. The barrel profile on the old rifles was obnoxiously thick and added a lot of weight to the front of the rifle and really didn't do much for you in terms of accuracy. These are very, very accurate rifles with either barrel profile, so most shooters will never really know the difference or see the difference between the two. So it's also worth mentioning that commercial rifles do not have a chrome lining in the barrels, unlike the HK416 and HK417 that the military buys. Uh, this is because a lot of companies have this mindset that a chrome lined barrel will not be as accurate and although that means it'll last longer with the chrome lining they think that because consumers and the commercial market are typically more picky about things like accuracy that they forego things like chrome linings 
uh, in order to squeeze out every bit of accuracy they can and to justify the massive price tag of rifles like these. There are chrome-lined barrels available for these aftermarket, but they are not cheap. And in the case of the Brownells barrels, which are more affordable, um, they have oversized gas ports, and in some cases the gas ports are actually located in the wrong spot and limit what kind of gas blocks you can install on these. That becomes more of an issue if you're going to install an adjustable gas block like I plan to. But that is worth mentioning, that the stock barrel, if you see yourself needing a chrome-lined barrel, either for the durability or the heat resistance or the resistance to rust, um, then you will have to swap that out. The commercial rifles use the same magazines as the HK417, which are made of a translucent polymer and are available in 10 or 20 round capacities. It's worth noting that these mags do not fit in most 308 mag carriers, and they often require a specialized pouch or a dedicated chest rig. So do be aware of that. And this is probably my least favorite feature on the commercial rifles that is present on the MR556 and the 762, but is not present on the HK416 or 417. And that is the takedown pins, which require a small tool in order to push through the receiver. The regular MR762 actually comes with this tool located inside the butt pad, which is easily removed and accessible, though the LRP model, or long range package, which I have here, does not include that tool because the G28 stock, which this package includes, does not have a storage compartment to store that tool. In lieu of that, I've used a small Allen key, but in my opinion, this feature is totally useless. It makes no sense. Nobody in the history of the AR platform and design has ever complained about the takedown pins being too easy to push out. So to me, it makes no sense that you need an additional tool just to do a simple field a strip of the rifle. So speaking of the G28 stock that is present on this rifle, this is pretty much the only feature I think that validates the LRP model. So the G28 stock has an adjustable cheat comb which magically stays in place when you adjust the length of pull. Um, this ensures that the cheek rest does not block the charging handle from being used at any position. It also keeps the cheek riser in one consistent place um, so that when you set your eye relief on the scope, your cheek can always just go to where that cheek riser is and you will have the proper eye relief. So it's a pretty cool stock. I really do like the design of it. If you were to buy this stock and the buffer tube required for it to work properly separate from the rifle instead of buying the LRP package which comes with it, uh, it would run about $600 to $1,000 um, and that's if you can find one in stock. But like I said, the LRP does come with it. So that is the one redeeming feature of the LRP package. Everything else, um, I think, is kind of a waste of money and does not justify the added price tag of this package. So the other differences with the LRP package include uh, tan furniture. It comes with a Harris bipod with a LaRue mount, a Pelican case, and a few extra accessories like a sling. Um, and it also comes with a Vortex Viper PST Gen 2 scope. Now, nothing against Vortex or the Viper PST scopes. I think they're fine for most people's applications. But if you're like me and you're buying an HK rifle, you're going to want to put better glass on it. And so that scope is just kind of underwhelming for this quality of rifle. Luckily, I was able to negotiate a price for my rifle without the Vortex optic, since I have other plans for the optic I want to use on it. And overall, I just don't think the LRP package is worth it. Really, it just saves you the trouble of hunting down that stock assuming that you want the G28 stock and installing it yourself. And it should be mentioned that HK didn't even bother putting one of their own overpriced, albeit nice feeling pistol grips on the rifle. They instead included a rubberized Magpul grip, uh, which I'm also going to swap out once I can track down the original HK grip. And that leads me into my future plans for this rifle. So I have two main different directions that I'm looking at going with this rifle. The first of which I'm considering is a 12 inch Assaulter build, which would use the AAC SDN6 suppressor and a Night Force NXS optic. This was a configuration that was commonly seen among, among Navy 417s, but the direction that I'm leaning more towards in that makes more sense to me is the aforementioned 14 inch DevGuru Recce build. While sourcing some of the parts such as the handguard or the adjustable gas block will probably be very difficult, this route would allow me to keep the G28 stock 
and would not require a tack stamp for an SBR since I can pin and weld the muzzle device to reach an overall length of 16 inches on the barrel. If I decide to go this route though, I cannot get the correct suppressor, um, which would be an older B&T Rotex design, which is not commercially available, nor has it ever been. So I would likely replace that with a Surefire SOCOM 762. Um, the optic for this build would be pretty easy to track down. It's a Leupold Mark VI, which I believe would be a more fitting optic for this rifle and would fit its capabilities and its potential in terms of precision shooting a lot more than the smaller Night Force optic. But let me know in the comments section below which version of the 417 that you think I should build. Should I do the 12 inch Assaulter or should I do the 14 inch Recce or something else entirely? Let me know. I'm going to follow up this video with a full build series in which I'll detail this project as I gather parts for it and as I make progress on it. So subscribe so you can make sure you don't miss any of those updates. Don't forget to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it and thank you for watching.